Father God, we just thank you for your word this morning. Father, we thank you that in your word we have the words of life. And Father, we enter into your word with reverence this morning because we desire to walk in your ways. We desire to have the paths to walk in established in our lives. And Father, we distrust the Holy Spirit this morning to make it come alive in our hearts and in our minds. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to start in Genesis. And this morning, I'm probably going to answer some questions you probably didn't even know that you had. And probably open up new questions for you. And I'm going to be dealing with knowledge this morning. How many know that the conundrum that we find ourselves in, the, the thing that put all mankind into jeopardy, was overknowledge? It was overknowledge. What was the tree in the garden about? Knowledge. And so we need to examine from the Word of God and understand that there are two kinds of knowledge. And unless you understand that, you're prone to follow after the wrong one. And so I want to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. And this is God giving commandment to Adam. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. How many know that's a harsh thing? That means you're going to get a bellyache. That means you're going to get sick. There's a cutting off that happens. And then we see the enemy question, God, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, and the, servant sa the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. You know what he just called God? A liar. Called God a liar. For God knoweth that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, What's well, interesting, God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you're going to die. Do you know Adam lived just shy of a thousand years? A day unto the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So from God's perspective, in the day that he ate of it, he died. He didn't see a second day from God's point of view. But at the same time, we need to understand that death is separation. When you physically die... Your spirit man and your soul is separated from your body. God was saying the moment that you eat of that fruit, you're going to be separated from me. And we're going to see that in this narrative very, very clear this morning. Because we, we need to understand that, that we need to understand several things about knowledge. Now, first of all, what we see here is that there are two types of knowledge. Every evening, God came and walked with Adam and Eve. Could you imagine you had the creator of heaven and earth coming down and personally walking with you? Now, they didn't just sit there and just kind of stared at the stars. They communed with each other. There was communion going on. In that communion, Adam could have asked God anything. And God would have answered him. Anything good that Adam needed, any knowledge that he had, God could have given him. We need to understand that all true knowledge comes from communion. you got to commune with something. We're even going to see this historically. Now, God, when he was communing and fellowshipping with Adam... He wasn't going to give him half-truths or tainted knowledge. He wasn't going to, because there is knowledge, there is understanding that takes you away from the things of God. And there is a knowledge that can draw you closer to God. They're both knowledge. They just come from different sources. Now, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, this tree is the source of knowledge that did not come from God. It contained tainted knowledge that included evil. In other words, the knowledge it produced is not just about evil, but would make an individual one with evil because it comes out of communion. Now, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, they did more than just violating God's command of don't eat of the tree. 
Because that's, that's basically everybody says, well, all they did was break one little command, not eating of the tree. There had to be more there than just a violation of a commandment. There was something deeper here. Adam committed high treason against God, and his treason included several things. First, he submitted himself to someone other than God. In other words, he willingly came under the authority of Lucifer for a perceived benefit. And we're going to see this theme over and over and over again. We'll, we'll see it in Babylon. We'll see it in Egypt. We'll see it in, in Greece and in Rome. We'll see it in science. We see it in the halls of Freemasonry. You see it in the witch and the warlock. It all originated with Adam. Because if knowledge comes from communion and submitting, Adam chose to, to submit to someone other than God for the knowledge that God would not give him the knowledge of evil. Every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every good gift. In him there is no, there is no shadow of turning. You know what that means? He, God's not a yin-yang. He's not half, half good and half evil. Of good and evil. He's all good. He's all good. Adam chose to obtain knowledge that did not come from God. But to do that, he chose to break fellowship with God and to establish communion or fellowship with another source. When he did that, the moment that Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they broke fellowship with God, and they were infused with the knowledge of evil. And that, that word knowledge isn't, isn't like statistics. It's, it's not just information. It's like, and e, Adam knew Eve, and she had Cain and Abel. Can, can you see the, there, there is an intimacy there that comes with knowledge. And so when he did that, he became infused with evil. This does not mean that he only understood evil, but how to be and to produce evil. How many know you can't get that from God? Right here in human history, mankind was born again for the first time. Adam and Eve received a new nature that was evil. They took on the nature of Lucifer. That's why Jesus could tell the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. Because they were flowing in some other knowledge besides that which came from God. They, they had entered into some things. Now here, here's some things we need to understand. The, the two types of knowledge. All true knowledge comes not just from information, but from communion. That's why in America, by reducing everything to statistics, you know, every child in America can tell you why Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but no, none of them are taught what was in his heart so they could commune and understand with what was going on that motivated him. And so what we have are educated idiots coming out of school today because there, there is no community. It's just filled, just filled with information that doesn't mean very much of anything. Knowing when Columbus sailed, is that going to help you at all in life? But see, what they separated from that was his communing with God. And that communing caused him to be driven to do something in his own journals. You know, the, and, and Columbus is like all of us. There's bad and good in all of us, isn't there? We, we all make a lot of mistakes. But in his own journals, he was driven to find another continent to take the gospel that had never heard it to was the reason he sailed the ocean blue. But see, they, they got to, by separating that to where we can't even have any communion or meditation on what drove him, we're really separated, really, we're, we're informing people but making them stupid at the same time because there's no real knowledge, there's just information. Therefore, you can't be inspired. And if you can't buy, be inspired by people that were touched by God, you can only be inspired by the other side. Because all knowledge, knowledge is more than information. Knowledge is revelation that is birthed out of a heart that has communed with something that helped you put the pieces of the puzzle together for life. So therefore, there is a spiritual aspect to knowledge and wisdom. There is always. 
in the heart of an atheist, there is a spiritual aspect to that knowledge that he has and it's driving him in a direction. To the man of God that yields to God and communes with God, knowledge begins to spring up in him and drives him in a different direction than the scientist. Let's look at Psalms 19.14. This is one that we sing quite often. And I'm probably not going to get through all my notes this morning because after I got up here, I thought of 100 things I should have added. I didn't add or forgot to add. And so if I, if I run out of time, I'm just going to put a marker in. We'll come back next week because this is really important. This is going to answer some questions for you. Now it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Now I would, could I also put in there that, that the, the psalmist was sensitive about the meditations of his heart because the meditations of his heart were based upon who he was communing with. When you meditate on the word, it's not just meditating facts and figures. As you meditate on the word, you're communing with God, and the Holy Spirit makes that word come alive. That's one of the reasons why we have dead theology by dead theologians that aren't walking with God because they are communing with their own intellect, and they are not communing with God. Therefore, they can't really see what's here. They can parse the Greek and the Hebrew and miss the whole point. I've got volumes of exegetical works that, that are brilliant in their explanation but don't have a clue all at the same time because they weren't connected spiritually to the source to understand that which they were exegeting does that make sense Communion involves meditation. Now, when a, medi when a believer meditates on the Word, he is communing with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit begins to build a new level of knowledge of the Word and of life in his heart. When Mary was set free from depression, she began for the first time really communing with God. And she showed me just how stupid I was. Because I had been trained theologically by men that weren't necessarily communing with God. The, you know, well, 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 question the rapture, question this, question that. What do you, but my rhetoric is all into place when what are you talking about? But I had consulted with theologians and had never communed with God on the subject. As guilty as many ministers are, if they would go and commune with God and then open up the word, they'd find out a lot of their doctrines would take a shift. Now, when a non-believer meditates on a problem or on knowledge, they are connecting to another spirit that begins to mentor them in dark knowledge and dark wisdom. It may provide ideas and solutions that seem profound, but will always be laced with evil. You know what, what's, what's interesting to me, because I, I, I try to keep my fingers into what's going on in science and in physics and and I mean, I'm fascinated by the CERN collider. They're trying to find the God particle and, and all these different things. Now, they all reject God, but their logo is Shiva from India, which is the, the goddess of, of destruction so that she can dematerialize and remolecularize all matter in the universe, according to Hindu philosophy. They don't believe in God in the Bible, but they'll put that thing up there. They didn't put a Bible up there as a logo, did they? Why? Because they're drawing from that knowledge. There's something they're communing with. When I read about grim technologies, and that's dealing with genetics, robotics, uh, and, and using different type of, of machinery to enhance, it's part of the transhumanist movement that they're trying to create human 2.0 with, with uh, using nanoparticles, nanomedicine, enhancing humans with, with cyborg implants, all these different things. I mean, it really sounds very Star Trek-ish, if you will. They're hard at it. They're driven at it. They're, they admit there is a force driving them. One of the guys who's trying to develop the singularity, which is the, which they're trying to develop an AI that actually becomes self-aware. I'm thinking, haven't you watched Terminator? Skynet is never a good thing, okay? But, but yet he himself says that he is 
driven. There is, there is a force that he cannot explain drives him to come up with the calculations for this development. And then he'll go to bed at night just all, almost at, at, at all at what he's developing. And then he'll wake up in night terrors realizing that it could destroy the world. And the next morning he gets up and there's this dark force just driving him to do it. They've tapped in to a knowledge. I kind of wonder if the Lord would tarry if the singularity is not going to be the image of the beast. That will be a machine that become, that, I mean, it can absorb all knowledge of the, of the entire human race in one day and then supposedly begin giving us solutions. Here's the thing to homelessness. Here's the answer to cancer. Here's the answer to this. Oh, by the way, you're a bunch of maggots and I, I'm just going to do away with you. I'm going to send out my terminators. The Bible says that it's going to cause all men to receive the mark of the beast and if you don't, you die. They're driven to do that. We, 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 get a, we, we get a hint of this in Eastern religions that teach meditation techniques that empty the mind and they open up the individual to demonic influences for dark mentorship. They call themselves spirit guides. Because only true wisdom and knowledge can come from communion. To the Greeks, it came from Athena. That she, she had two things. She had a spear and she had a helmet. The helmet was, gave her invisibility that she could move stealthily throughout human history. And that she was known as the spear shaker, that she would shake her spear in the face of ignorance. And they worshipped Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, because they knew communion with that spirit would open up things. That's what the, the Tibetan monks do. That's, that's what all these different ones do. And we, have, and we have scientists that do it. They have just sterilized it and called it science. And I don't know if I'm going to get into it this week or not, but the very foundation of science, of what we call modern science, its fathers were all occultists. Hmm. No wonder none of them like the Bible. Let's go to James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. James talks about this dark wisdom, this dark knowledge, because he looks at its fruit. James 3, starting with verse 13, Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if he have Bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and what? Devilish. That there is a wisdom that is devilish. There is a knowledge that is devilish. For where there is envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. For the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James had to say, listen, you, you forget. There's two sources. And did you know that God's word, I didn't have a chance to look this up this morning, just kind of one of those 100 things that popped in my mind. The Bible says God's commandments are as a tree of life. There is a tree of life. As I commune with God, I begin to live. I begin to live. And everything in our society is going the opposite direction. Now, I want to look at it. So I'm going to take a, a, a second look here at Romans chapter 8. God kind of opened it up to me, and I look at it different than I ever have before. Because how many know what we call law? Now, to an American, we call law a set of rules on a book. We have traffic laws. We have so many laws in America that you can't hardly take a step without tripping over seven of them in this country. I don't know how many millions of laws, half of them contradict each other. And it depends on which bureaucrat which wants to interpret the law whichever way he has the mood for that day is how it's enforced. 
That's not, that is not the Hebraic concept of law. Torah literally means loving instruction. It's instruction. And so for when, when, when a Jew looks at the Word of God and sees law, they automatically think instruction. It is, it, is, it is helping me hit the mark. The very root of Torah means to shoot an arrow and to hit the mark. It's showing me how to walk with God. It's providing instruction. It becomes a tutor. Did not the Apostle Paul actually use the word tutor for the word, for the commandments of God, to lead me to Messiah? Then after they lead you to Messiah, they become the tutor to teach how to walk with Messiah. So when we see law, there, there is instruction here that is imparted by communion with the tutor that provides instruction. So now let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that walk in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. If you walk after the flesh, who's tutoring you? Who's mentoring you? Lucifer. Hasatan, the enemy, the adversary. But after the Spirit... If I'm walking with God and can communion with God, who's mentoring me? Holy Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, I historically, my historicity in this teaching is that the Torah didn't change. The cross changed my perspective to the Torah. And there is a truth about this. But what I completely missed until this week is that the Torah of life is the Torah of God, the instruction of God. The Torah of sin and death is the instruction that came from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Bam! God, God showed me that, and I picked myself up, shook myself two or three times. Because I walk in the Spirit, and I'm communing with the God of heaven and earth, as I get into his word, the instruction of God sets me free. Let me give you an example. There are two laws that we use every time you get on an airplane. One of them is called law of gravity. How many know if it was not for the law of gravity? this fat boy would be floating right now. You'd float off this planet. And the only way that I can supersede the law of gravity is with the law of lift. When it goes into operations, airplanes can fly. But the moment that you stop doing, the moment you stop doing what engages the law of lift, the law of gravity takes back over. I have been freed from the law of sin and death as long as I'm walking in the Spirit because I'm communing with the Holy Spirit and he's making this word come alive and it supersedes the laws of sin and death. But the moment the enemy can stop me from communing with God, the other takes back over. I need an organ. Oh. <laughs> for the law, for the now we're now we're law jaundiced because the enemy knew it takes two things. It takes God's commandments plus communion with him to neutralize the devil. And so we have a lot of Christians that are communing, trying to commune with God, but they're trying to do it apart from his Torah, and they find themselves communing with other spirits. Because a religious spirit will enter right in there and he'll turn all this into bondage. He'll turn all this into a perversion. He'll turn this into all grace that you can get away with anything you want and now because of the cross, God's got to accept you. When the apostle Paul said after the cross, if you will, if you do these things, you ain't getting in. Maybe the apostle Paul hadn't heard of grace. <laughs> Wow. 
Every morning when you get up, you need to say, Father, I am communing with you today, and I thank you that your word plus your communion with me as you instruct me and you mentor me and you disciple me, I am every day being set free of the law of sin and death. And that's the thing I forgot to put in my notes this morning. <laughs> Woo! I made a statement that all science is based on the occult. How many know science didn't just start yesterday? There, there was something called the Renaissance in history after the, the Dark Ages and, and after the, the, the beginning of the, the Protestant movement and the, the Catholic Church had everything so tight. Now what we don't understand if you don't study history is that there were two huge occult libraries in Europe. Both of them were held by the Catholic Church. One was the Greek Orthodox Catholic Church and their library was the uh, Library of Alexandria. The other one was called the Vatican that held all esoteric knowledge that had been developed through Babylon, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and finally the Romans. The, you have that direct lineage all the way back of esoteric knowledge and in that esoteric knowledge they knew how to create and to sway nations. That's one of the things the Vatican has always bragged about. Even in the formation of America we had Jesuits whispering in the ears of many of our of our founding fathers saying if you'll lead, if you'll give o over to us and let us influence you, we'll teach you the secrets of creating, sustaining and swaying nations out of occultic knowledge. Knowledge that had been mentored over the millennia by demonic spirits eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. With the dark ages, the great library at Alexandria had been destroyed. So the only repository of secret knowledge was held by the Vatican. And what you find in the, uh, in the Renaissance especially among Protestant ministers, was a hunger to recapture the knowledge that was lost in Alexandria. One of the key ones, anybody ever heard of Sir Isaac Newton? Okay. He was a devout Christian for his era. Very devout Christian for his era. But yet within that era, there was this serpent that was going back and forth throughout them saying, we need to rediscover the secrets. If, we're, if, we're going, if we as Protestants are going to overcome the Catholic Church, we have got to recapture all that lost knowledge that was lost in Alexandria. Yeah, it's like... And so you have this guy that was devoted to Jesus, was fluid in Greek and Hebrew and Latin and several other things. I mean, he, he was a brilliant man. He's the one who developed something called calculus. Algebra wouldn't do. It wouldn't do what he needed, so he invented his own, he invented his own mathematics. My fear is where did you draw the knowledge to invent that? And you see him constantly drawing from, from esoteric knowledge to try to recapture that knowledge that was lost. And then you have non-Christians trying to do that. One of them was a guy named Dr. John Dee. And he lived in 1527 through uh, 1609. And this is what Wikipedia says about him. He was an English mathematician, an astrologer, an astronomer, an occultist, a navigator, an imperialist, and he was consultant to the Queen Elizabeth I. He devoted much of his life to the study of alchemy, divinity, uh, divination, and hermetic philosophy. Hermetic philosophy is essential to Rosicristianism. It is essential to Freemasonry. And it's actually essential to a lot of science. Uh, he goes on to say that D straddled the worlds of science and magic just as they had become, uh, were, were becoming distinguishable. So at the very foundation, he blends sorcery and the beginnings of science together. 
one of the most learned men of his age. He had been invited to lecture on advanced algebra at the University of Paris while still in his early 20s. Deed was an inherent promoter of mathematics and a respected astronomer, as well as a leading expert in navigation. Now, it goes on to say, and, and, and he immersed himself in the world of magic, astrology, and hermetic principle. He devoted much of his time and efforts in his last 30 years or so of his life attempting to commune with angels in order to learn the universal language of creation and bring about a pre-apocalyptic unity of mankind. In other words, he began to commune with demons. How many know if an angel came to you, he would point to Jesus? He'd point to the Word. He'd point to, he'd point to holiness. And when you read the writings of D, it's all occultic based. Many of the, 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 the magic square, the mathematical magic square, and all these things were channeled through him by angels that would come to him. Now, let me, let me say this for the believer. If you're lucky, you may have an angel once in your life come and share something with you. Once. How many know an angel only came to Mary once? Appeared in a dream to Joseph once. Now, angels can come to you and minister to you many times. You don't even know they're there. In, in the midst of, of, of a crisis, all of a sudden you get endued with strength and, 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 and courage. It may be because an angel laid his hand on your shoulder. But nowhere in the Word are we ever called to commune with angels. In fact, any Christian that I've seen that are all talking to angels all the time end up being fruit loops before it's over. Absolute fruit loops. Because we are not called to commune with angels. We are called to commune with God Almighty. No middleman. No middleman at all. And so here, the beginning of, of, of science with, with D, and here's another interesting fact. He was also a spy for Queen Elizabeth. And his, and his code name was 007. So before James Bond, there was Dr. D. One of his protégés, and, and Wikipedia didn't even connect this, a guy named Sir Francis Bacon, was a protégé. And he was especially, in, uh, he was very influential through his works, especially a philosophical advocate and, and a practitioner of scientific methods of discovery. In fact, one of them is called the Bacon Method. But what none of them cover is that he was an occultist. Every scientist looks back to him and the way that he encoded it, you can find one tree, but you can't find the other in the very rudiments of science. Now, some of the things, and this is found, there, there is a Christian researcher, Chris Pinto, in his documentary uh, entitled Secret Mysteries of America's Beginnings, Volume 1, The New Atlantis, details a lot of these things and a lot of this research. Uh, what's interesting, too, how many know that Sha William Shakespeare really wasn't William Shakespeare? Did you know that he was illiterate? He couldn't even sign his name, the real William Shakespeare. But since Bacon followed after Athena, whose main power was invisibility, and that she would shake her spear in the face of ignorance, he formed a council of occultists and illuminists that began to reshape the English language. The English language before Francis Bacon and all these, what they did through William Shakespeare, it was, it was like you were talking with a mouthful of mud. And some people that have ever been to England, there's still parts of England that kind of talk like that. And you're sitting there trying to pray in tongues, asking for God to give you the interpretation. What are you speaking? English. No, you're not. That was the original English. It was, it was a crude, rude language. And this council began to write these plays, and in these plays, they introduced 30, over 35,000 new words to the English language for occultic purposes to transform a society. And they called him Shakespeare because it was Athena shaking her spear in the face of the ignorance 
of the English-speaking people. What the Wikipedia also doesn't tell you is that he was one of the founding influences of both Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. The only reason that we have Elizabethan English is because of Sir Francis Bacon. At the same time, though, he took things. Um, I, don't, I don't have the information right offhand, but I remember there was a guy, and he was talking about, uh, you know, how Hebrew has, has numerical values, and he went with the English numerical values, and what he found was that English is exactly the opposite of Hebrew. That the numerical formula that can be done with English is the exact opposite of what it is in Hebrew because an occultist helped develop it. And so what we have, guys, in America and in the English-speaking world, we have the very foundation of science and language rooted in occultism that has drawn from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Now, originally in America, now I mean, America's had its problems. America's made some big mistakes, and if American people really knew some of the things that our government has done, especially over the last hundred years, there would be riots in the streets right now. There's a reason why a lot of nations hate America, and it's for what black ops most likely have done in the name of the greater good. But originally in America, get this. The first English Bible ever printed in America was not only commissioned by, but paid for by Congress. For one, explicit, for one purpose, to get them in the schools. What? Congress printed Bibles to put them in schools. The entire school system in America was established to teach men to read so that they could read the Bible. The Bible was the foundational textbook for education in America. Now, I know, I know we had our, our ins and outs and we had our problems. We had falling into sin and we had revival over those years, didn't we? But during this era, the family was strong, the morals of the average citizen were high, and America was rated number one in education throughout the world. In the turn of the 20th century, something came on the scene within the hollowed halls of academia called progressivism. They created the myth of separation of church and state. I mean, no, it's not in the Constitution. Do you know that? It's not in the Constitution. The First Amendment says the state shall not do anything to interfere with the church. And they even go back to a letter and say, well, actually, it was a letter that, uh, that Thomas and Jefferson wrote to somebody. I've read that section of the letter. He was, basically exp ex he was basically saying the same thing. The moment that you begin to put tax money or government influence into the church, it corrupts religion. Hmm. So they came up with that myth from the administration of Woodrow Wilson through FDR. America began to remove itself from God and the Word. All of a sudden... All these textbooks had to be pulled from our schools. I actually have one that the ACLU tried to stop being reprinted. That used to be a textbook because it taught of the Christian character of all the politicians that we had, many of the founding fathers. Because if, if, our, if our children could identify with them, they could be inspired by them to maybe communing with the same God these men communed with. Then there was also something called the establishment of the Department of Education. And out of it came something new. It was called secular. It separated the sacred. And all of a sudden now we had secular society. We had secular education. That did not exist until the progressives began to take over. Because, and have you ever noticed 
Why is it that we have jihadists that hate America, hate the Bible, and we have liberals that join them? Because they both have one thing in common. They hate this. Progressivism can exist as long as this is in force. Now, one of the things that I, I'm always amused at by the Illuminati is they always, they believe that we're so stupid they can put things in plain view and we won't see it. Now, when they created the, the crest for the Department of Education, maybe it should be a menorah because menorah refers to illumination and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Well, they couldn't do that. Well, how about the lamp of learning? How many have ever noticed the lamp of learning looks like a genie lamp? Do you know why? And I, this, this is the conundrum I'm in with the school. The concept of degrees comes out of Islamic education. That after Islam began developing, because in, in Paul's day, it's like when you graduated the school of Hillel, you became a sage, you became a master learner. Basically, there was no degree except doctor. <laughs> that, that was it. That once you graduated, you became a master learner. And it was even that way in, in, in the, uh, the Greco-Roman world until Islam began to do degrees. And it was not about becoming a master learner. It was becoming a master of your subject or a doctor of your subject. You are now the authority. Completely different than Hebraic. And then the Catholic Church got jealous of it, so they began instituting degrees in theirs. And so the lamp of learning is a genie lamp because the Islamic people were communing with another spirit for the knowledge they had. That's my conundrum in education. I try to make sure that on, you know, when, the, when our students get their rings, don't put that stupid lamp of learning on there. Try to put a menorah or something, you know. No, no paganism. But I want you to look at the logo for the Department of Education. The progressives told us exactly what they were going to do. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They used a tree. Not just any tree, it's an oak tree. Oak trees are sacred to the Illuminati and Druidism. And where does it get its strength from? Sun worship. And what are they going to plant in the minds of our children? Seeds from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And really, if you kind of look at how the branches go up in this, if you can look closely, it almost looks like there are serpents up in the tree. Let's compare the state of America and the state of education before they took the Bible out of everything. It used to be the only thing a kid had to worry about is getting caught with bubble gum in their pocket at school. That was, a, that was the basic thing. Bubble gum may be a little fight or something. You know, kids have fights. Now you've got to worry about switchblades and weapons and gangs. And even here in Missouri, we had one little girl raped twice while she was at school, and the first time, the district dismissed the rape charges. The second time it happened, the mother immediately grabbed up the child, took him to the doctor, and found out that she had DNA on her that was from the perpetrator. Hmm. Whoever th you know, schools were supposed to be a safe place. They used to be a safe place. Family used to be a safe place, primarily. It's no longer a safe place anymore. In fact, for some kids, the thing, the thing more dangerous than school is home. That's what happens when you stop communing with the God of this Bible and stop communing and, and staying in the Word and you begin communing with another spirit. That's why over and over again God said, he said, here's the thing of a pro false prophet. Everything they say can come to pass, but you better watch where the knowledge leads you. Science has a disdain for God, but he here's the conundrum with that, guys. All science right now is, is merging into making men gods. That's it. All science. I will soar into the heaven as gods. Why go to the moon so I can soar in heaven like gods? It's not just about discovery. All the nanotechnology and the grim technology and all that is about creating Captain America, except Captain America is going to be more like the Red Skull by the time they're through with him. 
if you know that mythology, in, in cartoonese. They're trying to redo Genesis chapter 6 from the dark knowledge, communing with the same spirits that did it in Genesis chapter 6. And for, for science to say there is no God, but I'm going to become one, how can you become one which, which there isn't any of? But they're consumed about doing it because as, as you draw from this tree, there is, a, there is a promise interwoven in that you shall be as the gods. You shall be as the gods. You shall be like the most high God. When the fact, well, I tell you what, guys, the more I commune with God, the more I realize I'll never be like God. I'm never going to be a God. I may be like Christ and walk in humility and walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can never replace him. I can never be like him. My most brilliant day, my most brilliant concept by myself pales in comparison to one little drop of information that comes from his hand. God can tell me something in the most simplistic ways that makes me realize just how stupid I have been all the years of my life and how all my education didn't matter to a thing because if I could have heard him, that's why God causes the simple things to confound the wise. You see, the devil, to make his mojo works, he requires algebra and calculus and, and trigonometry. I mean, it is the most mind-jarring, mind-bending stuff that you ever saw. And Jesus says, let me tell you how the kingdom works. Give me a seed. <laughs> you want me to talk about taxes? Give me a coin. Then Jesus absolutely blew their minds. I'm going to leave this dude alone. <laughs> God can take the most simple things. It's like looking at the two different laws. Believer, if you're walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have been set free of the effects of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. Because it is, a, it is, a, it is the spirit of death and destruction and evil and one of the reasons why Christians are struggling today, we spend more time communion with the snakes of that tree than we do the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And our very society has been embedded and infected. We're not setting looking at one tree, guys. We're doing what the occult wanted. We're setting in a grove of the trees of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, walk out of the grove. What did God always tell us to do in the Word of God about groves, when they were occultic groves? Cut them down. Be begin to commune with his spirit. And I don't, you know, this, this is also the conundrum to me within the, the Hebraic roots movement. How many have seen people that had the talits, that had the kippahs, even though you can't find a kippah anywhere in the world, the Word of God, it originated sometime in the Middle Ages. In fact, Catholics have been wearing them longer than Jews because it actually has its origin in sun worship. But you, you can take a guy that's not walking with God, you can put a keep on his head, you can put a talit on his shoulders, you can put a shofar in his hand, and he's still spiritually dead. Because it's not about external things, it's about internal things. That's why as a, as a Christian Hebraicist, I'm constantly looking for the spirit of the law. The Apostle Paul said the letter of the law killed because it causes you to miss the whole point. You've got to commune with God for that word to come alive. And then when you find what God was teaching you, you implement it into your life and it brings life to you. It's not just about going through the motions. And as I commune with God, as I learn to walk with God and commune with him and commune with this word, this is when the Apostle Paul says you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You get all the old seed out, start getting the new seed in, and as you do, you become living proof, a testimony to the world of the perfect, acceptable will of God. You start walking through what people can't walk through and survive. Guys, this is, this is so important. The days that we're heading... 
to survive, you better be a Daniel, a Meshach, a Shadrach, or a Abednego. You better be. How many know them boys walked with God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And they said, I will not bow my knee to anything or anyone but him. And even if it costs me my life, I will not eat of your fruit. Believer, what fruit have you been eating of? What have, who have you accepted as your mentor? Well, I got this angel comes to me. Wrong. You better have the Holy Spirit coming to you. We don't commune with angels. One day we will judge them, but we don't commune with them. Dr. John D. believed that he was communing with angels as they were teaching him alchemy and, and all these dark secrets. They were serpents out of that tree that were mentoring him and teaching him in the dark ways. And unfortunately, because a lot of the church has rejected the tour of God, we have a lot of ministers that are communing with the same kind of spirits. That's why it's all okay. You can sin. Everybody's just got to sin. Come on with me. Sin with me now. No. I used to have to sin, but I came to an old rugged cross. And when I crucified the flesh, I was crucified with him. I died to sin. That tree is dead to me. I don't eat of that tree anymore. I don't listen to the whispers anymore. I don't listen to the siren spirits that try to call me to eat and have munchies from that tree. I decide to commune with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because it took the blood of Messiah to get me there. It took him dying on a cross. It took him resurrecting three days over sin, hell, death, and the grave so that I could commune with the Father. And I'm going to stay right here and commune with this. When I do, and then something is produced, whether it's a science or not, there used to be a time, guys, before John D. and others, there were others that said the highest form of science was theology. Dr. D. and Francis Bacon changed all that. So they started munching off the other tree. Guys, what tree are you munching off of this morning? What tree are you munching off of? One will produce life and one will produce death. Now that fruit can look good to Eve. You know, it, it, the fruit look good. Make one wise. How many of the greatest atrocities ever committed in human history all started out looking good? Hitler turned an economy around faster than anyone else in the history of mankind. He did. Turned it around. And then about destroyed the planet. The same could be said for Karl Marx. There are ideologies. There are concepts that are permeated out of darkness. And James said, listen, you can tell their fruit. What are they producing? Envy, strife, death, hate. What are they producing? Fear. Believer. You have been set free from the law of sin and death. You no longer have to eat of that tree. You have been given permission by Jesus, by the price he paid, to begin eating of the tree of life. By communing with him and his word. If you do that, you can sit under all my lectures forever and not change one iota until you start communing with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Start communing with this word. If I can get you to do that, then you're going to get a whole lot more out of this. If not, you'll get interesting tidbits of information, but you're not going to get any knowledge. You're not going to get any wisdom. Because it can't come from a man. All the most that I can ever give you from the pulpit is milk. 
Milk is pre-digested word. I can give you what my communion with God, my communion with the word has produced in my life, and I have digested it, made it to where you could, that, that uh, uh, even a babe in Christ can receive it. But see, if you're communing with God and you're communing with the word, all of a sudden God, because of your personal communion, he can begin dropping chunks of meat into the stream. But if you're not communing and you're not, you're not doing that, all you're ever going to get is milk. That's all you're ever going to get. And I want you guys to live on spiritual meat. But to do that, you've got to, you've got to do it. Every morning get up and say, there is no, quote, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Make it a declaration of faith. I have been set free of the law of sin and death, and today I choose to set in motion by my faith the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And Father, I'm going to commune with you. I'm going to commune with your word. I'm going to move in kingdom authority. I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be led by the flesh anymore. I'm not going to be led by dark fruit anymore. I'm not going to be led by these things, but I'm going to be led by God. And as I do, it's slowly going to start superseding and get rid of all this stuff that the enemy had planted in my life because God has called me to soar all above it. That's our task. That's our purpose. That's our destiny. That's part of being conformed into the image of Christ. Oh. That's available for us. Oh. The kingdom is within, not without. If I can get it here, it'll start running out. Father, I just thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish where unto you have sent it. And Father, we have heard the challenge this morning that if we'll begin communing with you and with your word, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus begins to go in effect and it supersedes the law of sin and death. And Father, as we walk with you, that is the greatest threat that hell has ever seen. Because the moment that we start doing that, we become like Jesus, that we go about doing good and destroying the works of the devil. Now, Father, I ask that you would give us the grace and put the desire in our heart to make it so, we pray in Jesus' name.